Uh, next, we have Carrie Irvine, who has come all the way from North Tech in New Zealand. Um, Carrie is part of North Tech's desktop support team. She's been configuring and supporting Apple devices in a predominantly Windows environment since 2012. Um, being a relative newcomer to management about Apple devices has its challenges, but it's made it easier for her to find a way forward amidst, amidst, the, amidst the paradigm shift from traditional device management to MDM. Now, Carrie has a passion for automation, um, facilitating improvements um, to user experience and supporting ongoing research into adoption of emerging technologies to improve student outcomes. This is Carrie's first time presenting at Xworld. And those of you who know Carrie from the ANZ channel and the Mac Admin Slack would know her as the Drama Llama. And as Carrie will let you know, of course, there's been a bit of a drama before the presentation today. But thank you, Carrie. <laughs> um, yeah, so the drama leading up to today, I'll, I'll run through the whole story, actually. Why not? We've got time. Um, so this time last week, I had no voice, not a whisper. I was gone. Um, so it started sort of thinking of creative ideas of how I could still present. Um, interpretive dance was one option, so <laughs> um, another option was smuggling my three-year-old over to speak on my behalf. Um, she would have just looked at the pictures and given an interpretation, although someone pointed out that she'd just be asking to watch Paw Patrol after five minutes, so yeah. Um, so that was the first drama. I've got a little bit of a voice back and I'm hoping it'll hold out. Um, other dramas leading up till today, well, when I was first asked if I'd consider presenting, I thought, well, what could I really bring that would have any value? And I thought about it and thought, well, I've got some cool deployment workflows for my Apple TVs and iPads, I've done zero-touch automated carts, all these cool things. But then um, WWDC came along and pretty much um, all of those are in the rubbish now. So <laughs> I was left with nothing. <laughs> so I thought, well, what else can I do that's got any real value? And um, really the reason I'm here is because of the Mac admin community. And I thought, well, I'd like to maybe share a little bit of my journey as an MDM ad admin, or as I prefer to call myself, MDM wizard. Um, and hopefully there's some people out there that may not have quite got to MDM yet that sort of think, hmm, maybe I could do that and get some value out of what I've learned along the way. And um, yeah, for people watching the webcast, hopefully there's something worthwhile. Um, so I work at North Tech in Northern New Zealand, um, which is not part of Tasmania, just to be clear. <laughs> um, and, um, we have a pretty small team and a ridiculously complex environment for its size. We've got seven campuses and 60 community delivery sites. They range from CBD high-rises to literally a tarpaulin in the bush. Um, so those are the challenges that I'm up against trying to um, deliver technology to these users. And um, yeah, been relatively new to the Mac administration scene. Um, I drew the short straw actually while I was away on leave once, so that's how I ended up as a Mac admin. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will know by now what MDM is, but I thought I'd better just cover it off for anyone watching the webcast that doesn't know. Um, so it uses a feature called APNS, and here's some boring details on how that works. Okay, so now here we go. <laughs> it was quite an apt slide to lose. <laughs> So, um, here we have a dramatic analogy of the MDM process. So, we have an MDM wizard, happens to be a drama llama. Um, they cast a spell which contains two components. One is summon iPad and the other one is do my bidding. So, the Apple MDM unicorns, which um, I see <laughs> Ben had also discovered, <laughs> Have, um, have heard of our summon command and they go and hunt the iPad down and send it our way. And then the MDM wizard rejoices as the iPad does its bidding. 
So we didn't always work this way. At North Tech, um, when we started out, we had a very manual controlled environment and everything was done standalone. We had no deployment servers. Um, literally all our software installs were off CD or by manually copying a file from a network share. Um, and all of our licensing was done manually as well. So we used to walk around and punch in little keys. It was, um, yeah, pretty low tech. So um, other things that we had that were really cool back then were an ISA proxy server. How many people have had to deal with an ISA proxy server? Then you would understand the hell that those things actually are. Um, and there is no way an Apple device will play through one. Um, and we had just really restrictive network policies. They didn't facilitate use of anything really. It was all about blocking and controlling. And then things changed. So um, mobile technology really took a long time to get off the ground. A um, little bit of a side story. I went to the E3 gaming convention in 2003 and seriously amazing, mind-blowing event. But um, when I was there, there was this massive stand for Nokia and there was just nobody there. Everyone was around all these other stands, no one at Nokia. They had all these cool gadgets, mobile gaming devices, all sorts. No one even cared about them. And I remember looking at it thinking, hey, that's really cool. How come no one wants it? And everyone would just say, oh, it's just before it's time. No one's ready for it yet. Um, so that really did change. All of a sudden, and, and really it's probably down to the iPhone, um, those gadgets became the thing to have. And um, yeah, so users wanted all those shiny toys. The product vendors saw the opportunity to capitalise on that. Uh, the demand for newer features, more power, better cameras, meant that they could decrease the life cycle of those devices. And that posed a new challenge for us as well, because suddenly we've got devices that we used to have a five-year life cycle for, and now we're down to two to three if we're lucky. You know, So it's um, been very challenging. Our users became so much more savvy. Um, they literally know stuff before we do, and we can't assume anything as far as that goes. Um, and our system, systems, <laughs> systems just did not meet their needs anymore. So we sat back and reviewed our options. So with Paradigm Shift, there is a really big chicken and egg situation because um, the users can't change without us changing but we need their buy-in to begin that change, but they won't buy in because they don't know what the change is. And so it kind of goes around and around. Um, we met a lot of resistance from people who didn't want to change. Um, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And they were scared of that complexity that new systems would bring, especially anything involving that word cloud or <laughs> MDM was way beyond what most people were comfortable with back in 2011, 2012. But what we did see was that the writing was on the wall for us. If we didn't evolve, we were going to be obsolete. So we stepped back and realised that we couldn't do it alone. Like the IT department can't make this kind of change on our own, and single MDM admin certainly can't. So we went to our organisation and said, we think this change needs to happen, here's why, um, but it needs to happen in this way. We'd realised that the change needed to come from the top, that it had to start from our CEO, flow down to senior management, flow down from there, and without that buy-in, we would never have got it off the ground. We needed a forward-thinking ICT governance that could really drive that change across the organisation, get people out of silos and working together, and um, also justify our business cases, I guess, as well, which was a great help. We made the choice to be really proactive instead of reactive. Um, up to that point, we'd never got involved in new projects in that way. It was the first big project that we really stepped up into at that level to drive. And um, we made sure that our ICT strategic plan was reviewed and updated annually to support that at the business governance level. 
And that's pretty high level stuff and when you work in IT it's really boring and you don't want to know about it, but it really does matter because if you want to get anything happening in your business, it's actually a good idea. So, we listen to our users, we put in a JSS for Mac management initially and started managing our hundred odd Apple computers that we had. Um, they were all domain joined and started to play nicely and um, we stopped having all the security issues we previously had. Um, we also went with similar solutions for Windows around the same time. We broke down a lot of the barriers in our environment that were making it restrictive. Those things like the um, old ISA proxy server. <coughs> yeah. So um, we actually put in a next generation firewall and everything's just, um, yeah, goes through now, it's awesome. And um, we made sure that we were focusing on continuous improvement because that is an ongoing process. It's not something you can do for one month and then put it aside for the rest of the year. You have to make sure that you're setting aside some time at some point regularly to just check in and say, am I still improving? What feedback have we had lately? Um, we also did begin iOS and Android management testing around that time in 2012 and um, we ran a similar pilot for Android as we did for iOS and the Android tablets bombed, so um, yeah. And along came MDM. We had to trust Apple. Who here has had the fun of getting your network opened up to 17 slash 8? Yeah. Um, so I managed to get some support from Jamf actually to um, help push that through. That was really appreciated to the Jamf guys. I'm not sure where you are, but it was awesome. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, we had to jump through all those hoops with Apple to get our accounts set up for VPP, DEP, and Apple School Manager. Um, a really good tip for getting those accounts set up, if you're government-funded education, when you're doing the application, do not tick ed education tick government, and that way you don't have to provide a DUNS number. Um, I only found that out when I did the last application and wish I'd known it a lot earlier. Um, so we had dynamic control all of a sudden. You've seen in some of the other presentations today how that works, so um, just being able to jump in and change something pretty quickly was awesome versus having to actually get a device back in and, and do things. We were able to facilitate BYOD use. That was a big thing for the organisation as far as supporting the use of Apple devices. Um, they didn't necessarily want to be paying for them, so it definitely helped. Being able to just push the software out for a class was pretty cool. And also make sure that tutors could actually use their own devices in our classes with the software that would work for them rather than um, them all bodging things together and. So we kicked off a pilot study um, which was around enabling paradigm shift and the program that we chose for that was our sports degree course. And um, up until then they'd been working really manually. They had old analog video cameras and they'd go out and record stuff, come back, import it to a computer, analyse it. It was a nightmare and honestly I don't know how anyone was doing a sports degree back then when I see what they're doing now. Um, so we um, got that institutional buy-in from our governance and we made major improvements to our Wi-Fi network. It pretty much the whole lot went in the bin and we started again. Um, so this picture is not an exaggeration. That computer is what those students were working on prior to our iPads. Um, so you can see what we were coming from and what we were going to and that really was a big challenge back in 2013 when we first gave iPads to the students. Um, our first deployment, I think only two of the students in the class had Apple IDs prior and less than half of them had even used a touch screen device. Um, so it was a big shift for us. We 
um, evaluated apps before we began, and that was more just making sure that advertising content, etc., on anything free was appropriate. Um, we just wanted to avoid any issues with that. And we put in place a training schedule and support for all the users because being a pilot, we thought that's going to be necessary up front. Um, we listened to our user feedback throughout, um, so we surveyed our users regularly and um, the feedback got better and better as we went along because we took that feedback and we actually processed it, actioned it, and went back to the users with the results. And what we noticed is year on year, those issues had actually gone away. We had actually fixed them because they didn't come up the next year. So it wasn't just like people have had the problem, complained about it, no one's done anything and didn't get back to you. So, um, One of the things that we did initially, thinking, oh great, you know, we can manage devices at last, we put a ton of restrictions on them and we really wish we hadn't because that was where most of the bad feedback came in. Um, so we reduced the restrictions um, after that and had a lot less issues actually. We found that the users maintained the devices really well. Um, and I'd just like to clarify that these students were like degree level students. We also have trialled iPads in lower level courses and in those um, we've found that we need to have a much more restricted environment for them. Um, but yeah, it really comes down to can you trust the users to be responsible, and in this case we can. We, um, over the years, we started out with our apps being deployed manually, that was fun, um, from Apple Configurator. Then we went on to um, initial self-service installation, um, so I'd give students an iPad that install the apps from self-service and sit there and wait while each one installed. That wasn't very much fun for them. So we got our VPP installations off the ground and automated as soon as we could. Um, since we've done that, uh, we've had very little contact with the students that have the iPads actually. Most of the issues were around app installation and um, account setups and that kind of thing. So as the need for iCloud accounts or Apple IDs to um, sign in for App Store for app deployment have gone away thanks to our MDM services, um, we just don't have to deal with that now. It's great. We got DEP up and running as soon as we could. Um, we just knew from the moment we heard about that that we needed it and I honestly Every time I get a non-DEP device come in now, I'm like, damn it, I've got to pull, it, pull Configurator out and do it the old way again. Um, so that was, um, yeah, DEP, definitely, if you can do it. And we're just starting to trial shared use iPads. So we have been running iPads in carts for the last few years as well. Um, at one stage, I had an amazing automated workflow. It was fully zero touch, like you just plug an iPad into the cart, walk away for half an hour, come back, and it's reset, everything's reinstalled, all the profiles are on, it's done. Um, and that was just done um, using some Apple script and a few command line bits and pieces. And if you look around on Google, you will find that. I just didn't put the link in here for some reason, I apologize. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited actually because although the fully automated system's broken at the moment, I can see from what's coming in the beta that I should be able to get it back there again, so that's pretty cool. Um, so if you're interested in that, just contact me directly and I can help you out anyway. Some other ways we've used MDM to our advantage. Um, who has had an issue with lost iPads? Gosh, who's using iPads? <laughs> Same people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So one thing that we um, learned early on was use lost mode with caution. Um, if you get too trigger happy with it, you're pretty much guaranteeing that device is going in the bin. And um, yeah, we thought, well, hang on. How could we maybe get them back a little bit more often? Um, so we thought about some creative ways to kind of mess with them. Um, one that I <laughs> mess with them, <laughs> sorry, assist them back. 
<laughs> one of the ways I like to do that is um, using restrictions profiles. You can do some really cool things in those. Um, you can reduce the functionality of the device while keeping it connected to Wi-Fi because in little old New Zealand, we don't have open Wi-Fi networks everywhere. So if a device is off Wi-Fi, it's gone. Um, one of the things I like to do is pull managed apps. Um, that's just a little sign that something's going on on the, on the iPad. And you can start restricting access to system features as well. You know, if people notice their camera's gone or something, then they get a little bit touchy about it. Um, but the thing I found really works and gets their attention is, um, yeah, my wallpaper. So I just roll that out as a wallpaper and um, tell them that if they don't contact us, then we'll proceed to re invoice them for replacement cost. And that's actually really, really effective. Um, I wish I'd thought of it a long time ago. Um, yeah, so be prompt with police reports too. If you suspect a device is missing or stolen, um, you're better off to put in a report and retract it um, because you'll get action a lot sooner and have a much better chance of getting it back. Um, and your debt collection, don't be afraid to use it because it actually works. Um, another way that we use MDM um, that's a little bit different is Apple TV. Um, so I was planning to run through my Apple TV deployment workflows, but with the beta, they're really out the window. Um, like they've already launched DEP publicly, but there's more changes even then, which I can't really go into. So, um, but we're running 85 fourth generation Apple TVs, and we have those across five locations. Um, we had to put them out with pretty much no budget, so we couldn't afford to install Ethernet cabling, um, which has left me with quite a few challenges that I'm sure you guys would understand, but no one else does. <laughs> so um, big one of those is keeping them connected. And when I first got in these Apple TVs, I started enrolling them in my JSS, and I actually had people laugh at me. They say, why, why would you put them in your JSS? You're just wasting your money on a license. All you can do is inventory them. Well, I thought about it, and I thought, no, because I can push certificates, you know. And um, anyway, I forgot about that for a year or two, and then guess what I needed to do? <laughs> we had a change of our radius source um, certificate, and um, suddenly none of my Apple TVs were connected anymore. Not one. So I created a new configuration profile, um, scoped it to the Apple TVs, all we had to do was walk into the, the room with a Wi-Fi hotspot and a remote and just connect it and bam, it was back on board. And it really was that simple. So um, that's the kind of power that you can have even without realising it through MDM. It's not necessarily about what you can do with it today, it's about what you can do with it tomorrow or next year. Um, so I'm still, as many of you noticed from my question earlier, hoping for more management options for Apple TV, um, definitely in the way of wallpaper and screensaver would be very cool. Um, yeah, and our Apple TVs are really just used for AirPlay from iOS and Mac, and they work well for that. Um, it's getting more and more stable all the time, which is really good to see. And um, being DEP enrolled, now I can just walk in with a remote, wipe them, and actually I don't even have to do that. Just sit in my JSS, wipe, bam, back to, back to square one. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, we also have gone away from net booting or net install for our deployment. Um, so originally we were fat imaging, then we went thin imaging. And the last two years, we've gone full DEP, MDM, VPP for our deployments. Um, the only additional tool I really use is Auto Package, and um, have a few bits and pieces there that just work their magic. So um, we do still get somebody, and it doesn't have to be anyone technical, to just go and punch in the location because we've had issues on our network with um, NTP timeouts, if, especially if we've got all the devices polling at once. It's just a bit of a nightmare. 
Um, so they just do that, and then the config just goes from there. Um, so I sit back for a couple of days and just watch my JSCS every year when I do my big re-image wipe type thing, which nowadays is just a wipe and off it goes, um, and just watch them all clear away, and then they're all done. Um, one thing that I have done is staged my deployment of applications and policies. So I always test my workflows because sometimes there's dependencies or if you have a large package or a group of large packages going out at once, we've only got a one gig network up to our arts department. So that's a bit of fun for Creative Cloud. So I just have them in groups. Um, once they've installed the last item in that group, fall into scope for the next group and then go from there. So it just kind of keeps it manageable for the network. And it also means that I can wipe them and deploy while people are using the network and now, without choking it. So yeah, definitely I've gone more and more away from any kind of manual packaging. Um, there's really creative cloud at this stage is the only thing I'm still packaging. Um, what we try to keep at the top of our mind throughout everything that we're doing there is that we're trying to provide solutions that facilitate ease of use. If it becomes about us and not the user, then is it the right thing to be doing? Probably not, but I mean, there's ex exceptions obviously, but we try and keep it that way. Um, so is MDM for me? Well, really, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that MDM's for anybody. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, you don't have to know how to use it. You don't have to know about Max to use it. You can get an out-of-the-box solution that'll work for you. you. Just click a few buttons in a GUI and you've got control. So anyone can be an MDM wizard. And if you would like to contact me, here are my details. Thank you. Okay, are there any, uh, does anybody have any questions for Carrie about any of the things that she's mentioned in her presentation? <laughs> okay, so um, from the point of where you started off to the point you're at now where management is a whole different thing altogether. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like it's really working for you and the, the staff and users. How long do you, do, you, do you feel that actually took you to get to that point of, of actually realising something's got to change and then actually getting to the point now where you feel a lot more in control um, using those tools? I think it's, once again, that chicken and egg situation. So a lot of it was the tools weren't necessarily there when we started. Um, so if we had those tools now, probably wouldn't take very long at all. And if you get one of those out-of-the-box solutions, you'd be up and running in minutes. Like, honestly, they're that amazing. Um, but for me, it was really probably a couple of years, but I had really good support throughout that time that helped me chip away at it. Um, yeah, so. Can I ask, um, because you were saying you came from a Windows background, this was all new to you at the time. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, you know, putting an out-of-the-box solution together pretty quickly and not needing to know how the back end works and ticking boxes obviously requires a pretty good integrator to come in and set that up um, and support the deployment of that, that system. Uh, who did you find in New Zealand to be really helpful for that? Was it internal um, support? Was it someone you had to go to Jamf? Was, was there something like um, that? So we had our um, TANS network, it's like a polytechnic network, that um, recommended the Jamf product. And um, we went and viewed that at the first organisation that had put it in in New Zealand and liked what we saw. So we were, I think, third to get it installed in New Zealand. And, and did, did Jamf come in to install it for you? Um, yeah, you I think we jump? had Comp Now come over yep, okay. and do it at the time. Um, yeah, but and did the jump start and then did the Jamf certifications. Um, doing those certifications, I remember at the time thinking, why would we be doing that? It's kind of, you know, seems a bit silly. But what it did really give you was that support network around you. You met other admins in the same boat as you. And um, yeah, that was really the biggest thing I got out of it, was just the people to actually support you when you needed it. Yeah. Um, when you moved your lab machines to using DEP, um, did that increase the time it took for 
deploying those those devices? Um, yes and no, because what I found was none of them failed. See, when I wasn't using DEP and using the systems I'm using now, I'd always have at least five computers that I'd have to go and track down and manually rip to bits and redo. Um, and that doesn't happen now. So it's actually saved me a heck of a lot of time. I'm um, realistically kick it off on a Friday, come in Monday and everything's done. And you can refine it down to a smoother process. Um, like if I really wanted to, I could push on the Creative Cloud installers in the background. I do pre-cache all my installers before I install them as well. Um, so the user could be working on other apps if they really wanted to, and then that'll kick in and install. So you know, there's ways that you can speed it up for the user, and I'm very interested in checking out Trigger as well. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Carrie. Nice.